we're going to start from top, we'll give you guys a brief introduction about ourselves. So, um, as as the slide suggests, my name is Vicky. I'm a second year student here in the Biological and Environmental Science PhD program. I currently work in a lab over at Brigham and Women's, uh, where I study all sciences. My name is Noah. I'm also a second year graduate student at Harvard. Uh, currently, I'm working at a lab at the Harvard studying cancer biology, but during my uh, undergraduate, during college, I studied Parkinson's disease in worms, so modeling Parkinson's disease in worms. So I'm going to hand it over to Vicky to give the first part. All right, so the title of our talk is High State States, the Science Behind Prions, Mad Cow, and Neurological Disease. Uh, so, as this talk is fairly neat, we do have an outline. <laughs> You'll we'll have an outline as soon as I figure out how to read the answer. All right. <laughs> Let me. Okay, so uh, our talk will be divided into three parts. We'll first start with an introduction into mad cow disease. Then we'll talk about prions and proteins, and we'll finish off by covering other neurological diseases. All right. So part one: mad cow disease, or how we learn not to eat in the brain. So the year was 1985. And we, are, and we are in the United Kingdom. What happens is an unsuspecting farmer finds out that one of his cows is acting particularly strange. So this cow's kind of going a bit mad. Basically, the cow's not acting uh, normally. Anytime he interacts with a cow, the cow kind of has a more bizarre reaction. The cow is very confused, and the cow is hard to control. Um, so this started off as one case, but as time went on, we moved to 1992. And what happens is that uh, three in every 1,000 cows in the United Kingdom has this set of symptoms, and all these cows are going crazy. People call it mad cow disease. These cows are mad. Um, so all this while, uh, all, while this was happening, uh, the British government was telling people, "Don't worry, this is totally okay. There's though there may be something wrong with these cows, it shouldn't come to humans. It should just stay with cows, and everything's okay." And then we get to 1995. Um, in which the, uh, the, the first human victim gets this mad cow disease and they went to that. So this led to the question, what was making these cows go mad? And then also, what was making these humans go mad? So when we go and review the symptoms, what we see is that so there's uncoordinated movement. Both the cows and the humans uh, weren't able to move as well as they normally did. Uh, they were highly sensitive to normal stimulus. What this means is that they had a bigger reaction to what would be normal things. So, for instance, if you turn on the lights, uh, they would shy away from the light a lot, uh, a lot more than normal. If someone poked one of these cows or poked a person, they would also freak out more than normal. So, basically, they were acting a bit more bizarre. They were, they were reacting more to different things. Uh, they had unpredictable behavior. This was pretty self explanatory. You couldn't really tell what they were doing or what they were going to plan on doing. And finally, there's a general state of confusion, both in the cows and the humans. And all of these symptoms, when we think about them, kind of point to one bodily system. The nervous system, in this case represented by our brain. So what exactly is the nervous system? The nervous system helps us interact with our environment. So the nervous system uh, helps us take in cues that we get from our environment. So for instance, color, sense, location, vision. Uh, takes all this information and processes it and then coordinates the actions of the body accordingly. So for instance, um, if you're just sitting in a classroom and a tiger just runs through the doorway, your, your eyes are going to see that tiger, but your eyes are going to tell the brain there's a tiger in this room. And your brain is going to tell your body, you should probably leave this room before the tiger gets to you. So that's generally what the brain does. It controls a lot of things. Um, but that was just one example. So the three general components of the nervous system you have the brain, so this cartoon over here, this would be the brain, so this is a human cartoon. I uh, have a spinal cord, and then you have uh, the nerves. This, is, this point here makes it really hard to have the nerves. But you get the general idea. So the brain itself is made up of a variety of cells. One of those cell types is known as a neuron. Um, so neurons send signals to each other, very important in coordinating a lot of different functions and reactions. So, so, uh, so at the bottom here, we have a number of uh, a cartoon of a number of neurons. So, for instance, if one neuron is trying to tell the other neurons, hey, we should do this, they'll keep sending that signal down the line so that all the neurons will relay this information downstream. However, you can imagine if one neuron were to die in this pathway, 
Um, you're going to have a breakdown of this communication. So this neuron over here should be like, hey guys, we need to do this, but the neuron in the middle is dead. So the other ones are a little confused, like, what's going on? Um, so generally what I'm trying to get at here is um, when there's a breakdown of this communication, when certain neurons die, you're going to lose a lot of function in the brain. So going back to the idea that when they were looking at patients with mad cow disease and looking at these cows, they saw that they had a lot of symptoms that were related to the nervous system. So when they looked in the brain, they saw something that was made out of normal. So this image on the right, no, left, left, my right, your left, um, is a section of the human brain. So the purple dots, um, the purple dots are meant to be like the nuclei of the neurons, and the pink stuff is the other parts of the neuron. Um, so that's normally what this is staining for. However, and so here I'm putting point eight example of like a nucleus of the neuron. But when we look at patients or cows that have mad cow disease, what we find is that we don't have the same type of staining. What you see is you have a lot of these kind of white holes in the middle, and those come as a result because the neurons have died and they just left gaping spaces. So generally, you can see here there's the purple dots for where the, where the nuclei were, and the other pink parts are the general parts of the neurons, but there's still a lot of holes for where neurons used to be but have not died, so there's just empty spaces. So mad cow disease is also an infectious disease. So what is an infectious disease? Um, an infectious disease is caused uh, when a foreign object enters the body and damages the cells. So the reason why we knew this was an infectious disease because there were some because human patients and cows had similar symptoms. And when scientists dug a little deeper, what they found is that whenever these human patients had these symptoms and this disease, turns out they had eaten um, they had had some beef from cows that had. So I'd love them to believe that there was something being transmitted from the cows because I first heard the sick cow. Something was going between the sick cow and the humans, but the question is we didn't really know what it was. So when we think of infectious diseases, or generally when scientists thought of infectious diseases, they know of two examples of things that cause infectious disease. And I'm sure you guys have heard of these. So for instance, E. coli is a, is a bacteria, or uh, bacteria and viruses cause infectious disease. An example of bacteria, I got ahead of myself, um, is E. coli. So some of you may have heard of this before, um, when E. coli gets into food and causes food poisoning. And then an example of a virus would be the food virus, the thing that we're supposed to get vaccinated from every, um, every winter. And the general idea is that uh, these, so um, either food poisoning or the, or the cold or the common flu, both of these are caused when um, infectious agents enter the human body and cause damage. <laughs> So going off of that, in order for the scientists to figure out you know, what exactly was causing that cow disease, they had to try to figure out um, what kind of infectious agent they were looking at. So if we think about how we normally kill bacteria, there are a number of ways. One way would be using um, a disinfectant agent. So a lot of you have seen Purell around. It's made of a high percentage of alcohol. So when you squirt Purell out your hands and you rub it around, it's going to kill the bacteria. And another example is applying heat. So generally, we don't really eat raw meat. And one of the reasons is because there's a lot of harmful bacteria in the raw meat that would hurt us if we were to eat it. What we do instead is that if we apply heat and cook it, um, those harmful bacteria that are originally inside it are then going to die and they're not going to hurt us. So here, I have, I have drawn these bacteria in as these green cartoons. Right, so then we go back to our idea of, or go back to the idea of what exactly was causing the disease. Was it bacteria or virus? So what happens was that when scientists actually took the meat from a disease, from a cow that had a cow disease, and they cooked the meat, they found that the meat was still transmitted disease. So when you apply heat, that doesn't kill whatever is causing the disease. So they ruled out that it would be bacteria, because they knew that by removing bacteria with heat, you still cause the disease, therefore it was not a bacteria. And so viruses um, have DNA, like a lot of the cells in our body. When scientists then treated uh, the meat with different chemicals that would damage DNA and remove DNA, they thought that it still caused disease. Therefore, they ruled out viruses. It couldn't be viruses. So what exactly was causing disease? Um, so what they did, so what it actually wound up being was a protein, which was very revolutionary for the field. People did not realize that proteins could cause disease. 
Specifically, it was a protein called a prion, which we hinted at in the title of our talk. Um, so I'm just going to briefly define a prion um, here. So prion is an infectious protein that causes disease. The specific prion that is involved here in bad cow disease is known as prion protein, or known as prion protein, or PRP. So now we'll go more in detail about prions and PRP and proteins in the next part of the talk. So we go back to our diagram here. Um, previously, when we knew we had a sick cow, something was going from the sick cows to the humans. Before we didn't know what it was, now we know it's PRP. But the sad thing about mad cow disease and prions is that it's not a curable disease. So once someone gets the disease, there's nothing you can really do about it. So the best way to be able to prevent mad cow disease from spreading throughout a population is to find a way um, to kind of contain it, uh, to kind of contain any diseased cows. So here we go. Um, so this is basically the consensus of how the British government and different governments around the world uh, dealt with mad cows, prevented from harming more people. So here we have a country and our sick cow. So when there's a sick cow, um, the, the disease can be transmitted to other cows or to humans. Um, so the way that the cow, the cow can transmit the disease to other cows is that um, in the food industry, they used to have this practice where if there were ever parts of the cows that weren't used in the food industry, for instance, bones or other uh, bones or certain types of meat, they would grind, they would grind up whatever was left over and feed it to other cows. I know it sounds terrible, they don't do that anymore, this is part of the reason why. And then when they did this, they would transmit the disease from one cow to other cows. And it's pretty straightforward how you get the disease from cows to humans. But this idea that so if the disease transmits from a sick cow to other cows, it can also, those sick cows can also transmit the disease to humans. So in the end, humans are really the ones that lose. So you see these arrows here. Generally, we have to, the, the government had to find a way to deal with these different arrows to prevent the disease from being transmitted from the cows, from, the, from a sick cow to other cows to humans. So as I mentioned before, one way that they prevent the disease from spreading from cow to cow was to put a ban on feeding meat and bone meal to cows. So basically preventing, um, basically getting rid of the practice of feeding parts of cows to other cows. Now that sounds really bad. Because it was really bad in the food anymore. So that's really okay. And then the other way, and then um, the way to prevent, uh, um, to prevent infectious meat from going from cows to humans was that in slaughterhouses, they changed the way they processed meat. So anything they considered was, so they changed their guidelines so that now anything that was nervous tissue, so brain, uh, spinal cord, anything that contained nerves, were not considered risky material. So it's nothing that they would actually allow to be processed and be put into the food industry. So as a result, what we see here is, so this is a graph of uh, mad cow disease cases throughout time. We had a spike here about like in between, I think like 1992, 1993, about that time. And over time, uh, the cases have gotten less and less. And this is a result of changing uh, the way that we process, uh, process beef in the beef industry and making sure that um, no disease meat got into the food chain and harm other cows and humans. So that was the end of the first part, giving you guys a very quick overview of the history of mad cow disease. And here's a general summary. So first, mad cow disease is a neurologic disease. It affects uh, the brain, and it's not caused by viruses or bacteria. Instead, it's caused by a protein, specifically PRP. Again, now we'll go more in detail into this in the next section. Uh, there's no cure for mad cow disease, but the way that we dealt with mad cow disease was by changing food processing to decrease um, the, uh, the spread of, in, of infectious meat. Yeah. Questions? Yes. So you, know, you talked a bit about the uh, nervous system. I had a question concerning how mad cow disease affects the um, physical or motor system that moves through our body. Um, you, again, you talked about the like odd coordination with you know, hands you know, and stuff. So. Um, so the question broadly was, how does mad cow disease affect the motor system? So as you can imagine, um, from the brain, or the brain controls a lot of different systems, one of them being the motor system. Uh, there are neurons that go from the brain um, and then connect to our different muscles. And mad cow disease is a general kind of like dying of neurons all over the place. So what happens is that people and cows with mad cow disease do lose kind of control of their motor systems over time because all of these connections from the brain to the muscles 
um, will disappear over time as, as you go inside. So questions? <laughs> how did we think it got into the cow population originally? All right, so the question is, how did we think um, mad cow disease started in the cows, generally? Um, so there are a lot of theories. Um, so one particular theory that I personally like is that there is a similar disease in sheep called scrapie. The reason they call it that is because the sheep, um, when they get this neurological disease, will go up to like fence boards and scrape themselves until they start bleeding. They just, I mean, that's not so many sheep are going to do, it's sad. Um, but they believe that somehow it jumps from sheep to uh, to cows, they don't know how, but as you can imagine, if there's even just kind of like exposed sheep blood from a diseased sheep that somehow got to a cow, it can cause a disease to happen. So that's one theory, um, but it hasn't been proven because we want the struggle to find a way to figure out how exactly it started with cows. Question? Question. Can it be eradicated? Can it be eradicated? Not why? So that comes down to, oh wait, yes, I didn't the question. Um, so this comes down to like, can we really cure um, like mad cow disease? Because one way we could cure mad cow disease, if we could find a way to get rid of the protein entirely, we wouldn't, we could then get rid of the disease, right? Unfortunately, that's not entirely possible. Part of it is because prion, the, this particular prion, PRP, is particularly strong. It has some characteristics that aren't normal for a protein. No, we'll go more in detail into this. Um, so it's kind of hard to just develop something that would target this protein specifically and maybe and like and completely eradicate it. Um, so that's uh, quite. Uh, I'm gonna go. I think so. I'm gonna first. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that it's a cure, but do you know if um, it has to be vaccinated? So the question is, can cows be vaccinated? Unfortunately, not for prion disease, and this comes back again because it's a protein. So generally, the way the vaccines work is you kind of take a portion of a virus or a bacteria and you kind of train your immune system to recognize that, but prions are way too small for the immune system to be able to recognize. So there's no way, so you can't really take your immune system and train it to kind of um, fight against prion disease. We just eat meat, stay away from nervous system. Would, would meat still contain prion? Secondly, how does the prion get from Z track into the brain? Must be close to one or So the question is how does the prion go from our GI track into the brain and follow up? You know, if you were to eat other parts of the cow that weren't, you know, the brain or the nervous tissue, would you still get disease? Generally, the question, the answer is about, so the answer to the first question, we don't currently know how prions go from the GI tract to the brain. There are a lot of theories. It's an active um, area of research, um, but people don't really know how that happens. Now, the second, the answer to the second question, um, if you eat other parts of the cow that aren't the brain or the nervous system, could you still get the disease? The answer is probably yes. But something I did mention is that while, while they did change uh, the way that people, the, the way they slaughter cows by removing the risky portions, so removing nervous system, nervous system um, spinal cord, and neurons. They also, anytime a cow had mad cow disease, they're like, all right, we are not, we are not letting this cow into the food, uh, like the food chain at all. Like we're just not going to process this cow. Um, so that's one way that they made sure. So they just, even if a cow had mad cow disease, they wouldn't try to be like, all right, so this part is probably safe. We can try to sell this to people. Um, so the reason why if you're eat other parts of the cow that aren't the brain or the nervous tissue, could you still get the disease? There are some theories that prions may go to other parts. But this is getting to to Does it get into the muscles? Um it could so it um, could it get into muscle? Yes. I also do know that it does travel throughout the bloodstream. So that's when you get really, really difficult in terms of trying to really isolate out proteins. So I think there was, it's said that you sort of started to see increasing cases of mad cow in cows in like 1992-ish, and then it wasn't until 1995 we saw a lot, uh, maybe started to be cases in humans. Uh, you know, presumably people were eating cows um, during that time. What, what do you think accounts for that sort of gap 
in transmission to humans? Uh, so the question was, there's a, there's a kind of peak in cases in cows about 1982 and 1993, but we didn't see human cases until 1995. What accounted for this gap in time? Um, so mad cow disease does take time to develop. Um, so even though we had, an, we, we had a peak in cases in 1993, it would take a number of years before siblings even start showing up in humans. And even by the time siblings start showing up, the disease has already progressed uh, pretty far along because a lot of a lot of neurons have died in the brain. So that generally is what, what accounts for it. So even now, today, the science are so actively monitoring certain places they believe had people that had, had eaten um, contaminated meat because they're still trying to see if people are still developing symptoms. Because it still could be possible, even though it's been, what's the math? 20, 20 years? Yes. Yeah. Even though it's been about 20 years, um, people can still develop symptoms much later. Um, but that would only be people that have been exposed to the, to the initial meat, not anything after that, especially if with the changes um, in food processing and regulation. Question. One more question. What is oh, the last question? Is, yeah. uh, I mean, this is but. Uh, can you ask, how do you uh, find a test for the presence of prions? And is a test uh, too expensive to just broadly apply to all slaughtering capital? So the question is, how would you, okay, is there a test to test? Or is it oh, well, so redundant? Is there a way to test for the presence of prion and is it expensive? I don't know the answer to that my head. My best guess is that there isn't really a best way to test for it. Um, because of the way you, the way that someone would have to do it would be to take the meat and to extract the protein and then from the protein to be able to identify where all the proteins are. Um, that inherently is a very expensive process in science itself, just in the process of doing research. So I can imagine it would not be something that they would be doing uh, very often um, in, in cows. So there's not really a reliable way to do it. It's, um, or at least not a, like, not a cheap or reliable enough way that people are doing it regularly, as it's as your question. Okay. All right. So, I will now turn, I will now hand the race to Noah, who's going to give you guys, uh, give you guys some information about uh, proteins and grants. Thank you. Great questions. Um, in this part of the talk, I'll talk more about what exactly is it for you, maybe you won't fit. Um, take some of those questions again, you could be more clear. Um, and I'll also go over what is it for you. So, as you just heard from Vicky, um, we, we learned the story of mad cow disease, and we learned that prions are uh, infectious proteins. So, in this part of the talk, I'll talk more about uh, characteristics of prions in this top row. And in the third part of the talk, we'll talk about different uh, other neurological diseases that have proteins involved, that have characteristics like prions. So, we'll take it a, uh, a bit to get to prions. So I just want to give you an outline of this section of the talk. First, I'll talk about proteins in general and how they're made. Then I'll talk about how proteins fold and get their shape. And, and we'll learn that prions uh, arise from errors in folding. So I'll talk about uh, those types of errors. So first, let's get into what is a protein. So many of you know proteins from foods, uh, meat and fish have a lot of protein. I see a lot of bodybuilders in the room, obviously <laughs> myself included. Uh, we know proteins as protein shape. But I, I want to convey that proteins are more than just food and more than just supplements for bodybuilders. They carry out a lot of cool functions in cells and in our bodies. So on the left here, we have this protein called an antibody um, that our immune system actually uses to detect viruses and bacteria and other things in our bodies that shouldn't be there. And what I want to impress upon you is this beautiful shape of an antibody. It looks almost like a Y, and these little bits out here are sort of like hands, and they can grab onto the foreign bodies. Um, I want to also point out that the different colors actually represent different chains of proteins. So the proteins have to sort of recognize each other in order to form these beautiful shapes. On the right is a protein called ATP synthase, um, which makes the energy of our cells, ATP, if you've heard of mitochondria as the powerhouse of the cell, it's because of the presence of this protein. Um, and you might, it's sort of hard to tell, but we think that this protein actually works almost like a turbine. So this part will spin and crank out uh, ATP. Another wonderful protein in our body is hemoglobin. Um, this is another uh, computer-generated model of hemoglobin. And um, this aura here is sort of the surface of the protein, and inside 
these ribbon like structures, this actual chain. And this rainbow color molecule is actually called heme, which is why we call it hemoglobin. And if you've heard of the impossible burger, uh, this is the molecule that they've also they started putting into the to need to take, make it taste more uh, blood like. And hemoglobin is in our blood and it's responsible for preparing oxygen, which are these blue spheres. So I know it's not uh, incredibly intuitive right now, but I hope you'll uh, take me on it that it's the precise location of these ribbons that allow the heme molecule to sit exactly where it's sitting and for it to transport oxygen. So the protein shape is really critical for its function. But what are proteins made of? So proteins are made of, they're, as I mentioned, they're chains. They're chains of amino acids. And what makes it special are these extensions from the chains that we call, that we call variable, variable groups or R groups. And the different amino acids are defined by different variable groups. So I'll denote one type of amino acid with gray amino acid with a R1 type of R group, uh, R2. And these different R groups have different chemical properties. So some of those properties are that they can be big or small, they can work as acids or bases, or they can have positive or negative charts. And so there are 20 different types of amino acids that go into building proteins, and they can form different sequences. And what the amazing thing is, if you, if you think that there are 20 different amino acids, and most proteins are made up of, of hundreds of amino acids, you can think of the sheer diversity of different types of chains you might get, which sort of explains how you get so many different functions of proteins. And so it might make you think, what determines the sequences of amino acids in proteins? And maybe you've come across it in earlier talks, uh, it's DNA. So the DNA is actually the instruction manual for how to build these uh, proteins from different sequences of amino acids. So now that I've talked about how proteins are the chains of amino acids, how do you get such beautiful intricate shapes? So again, remember that the different amino acids have unique chemical properties. And one important chemical property for a protein to get its shape is that some amino acids are greasy and they don't like water. So on the left, we have a cup of boiling water, and we all know that they separate. So this property I'll define as being hydrophobic from the Greek hydro the water and phobic fear or aversion. So a hydrophobic amino acid will want to propel water. So just to demonstrate that visually, again, we have two amino acids defined by different R groups. And I'll denote a hydrophobic amino acid with this orangey color that you think of oil. And so if you have some water, the hydrophobic amino acid will want to propel it. And it turns out that the main driving force for proteins to fold or to take shape from an, from an extended chain into a fold is they actually want to minimize the repulsion between the hydrophobic amino acids and water. So the hydrophobic amino acids will sort of clump up and try to separate from water. And if we go back to our friend hemoglobin, what I've done now is I've colored one half of the molecule. Um, I colored all of its hydrophobic amino acids in this RNG color. I left the other half as a reference. And what you can see is on the inside of the protein, you do have this hydrophobic core, a, a big group of hydrophobic amino acids. And so before I continue with my talk and get into errors of protein folding, I just want to take a quick pause for questions to make sure that this model is clear, that an extended chain of proteins, uh, amino acids that have hydrophobic amino acids, will fold to try to repel water. Are there any questions about that? Great. So now that I've talked about what proteins are made of, I'll get into some of the errors. So if you, if you go back to our friend hemoglobin, you may notice that I cheat a little bit in directing your attention to here, and that there actually are some hydrophobic amino acids that do lie on the surface of proteins. So this brings us to the concept that protein folding is actually a dynamic process and is reversible. So you can have this extended chain of amino acid, try to adopt this one fold to minimize its repulsion to water, you can actually get the reverse happening and have this folded protein go back to the extended chain so that maybe you can adopt another type of fold. You can see a uh, difference. And maybe this will have a better repulsion from water. And the stability of each fold depends on how hard it is 
to get back to this unfolded state to try to test out another shape. So this is a very dynamic process in cells. And what can happen is that you might get a fold that looks like this. That's not perfect, and you actually get uh, an exposed region of hydrophobic in your axis that might be too stuck to unfold to get back into this extended chain. So what happens when that happens? We, we call it a misfolded protein. And the cell actually um, can adapt to this. The cell has machinery to try to unfold it and start it over. The cells can recognize it and try to destroy it. Or you can get this third property of aggregation. I'll define aggregation um, as a sticking together of proteins, which I'll demonstrate in the next couple slides, or a clumping up of proteins. And I'll call one of these clumps of proteins an aggregate, which we'll use uh, throughout the talk. So let me just show you what aggregation looks like. If you have two of these misfolded proteins with the exposed hydrophobic patch, you can sort of have them stick together like this. But I call this innocent uh, protein aggregation because it's just two. And actually, most of the cell machinery that I talked about in the last slide can recognize a small aggregate. So how does protein aggregation get out of control? Well, I'll just make uh, a couple of small changes and I'll add another exposed hydrophobic patch here. So now when we have two proteins, they come together like before, but now you still have exposed hydrophobic amino acids. So more protein chains can come on, attach there, and again, now make it a little bit more complicated, these attach here, and then Now everything is totally out of control and you have these large clumps of aggregates. And it turns out that these aggregates are super strong. So again, if we take um, one of these small, uh, uh, kind of two proteins going together, if you apply heat, you can actually separate them. But with these strong aggregates, if you apply heat, they stay together. So this might make you think of the meat from cow, mad cow disease, that even when you heat up the meat, you don't get rid of the, the prions, the prion protein. So that gives us our second characteristic of prion, that they're misfolded and they aggregate. But what's the big deal? So what if we be aggregates? So that would introduce us to our third concept, that prions can actually template the folding of other proteins. So templating is the process by which a misfolded protein causes a normally folded protein to also become, to then become misfolded. So I've demonstrated that here. Again, we have our extended chain going through this nice fold to try to repel water. And if we take this uh, correctly folded protein and we add the prion aggregate, now this correctly folded protein becomes misfolded. So as it happens, PRP is actually, the prion protein found in Nakazi is actually found in the human brain as a correctly folded protein. We don't exactly understand its function, um, but it's there. And when the meat from when the prions from the meat of mad cow disease, interact with it, now we have a template, the misfolding of the, the prions in our brain. And you get these aggregates, which eventually lead to neuron death. And so with that, we now have our three characteristics of prions. Um, they're infectious proteins, they misfold and they aggregate, and they can also template the misfolding of other proteins. And so the next part of the talk, we'll talk about two other neurological disease where we see some of these characteristics. And to summarize this part, uh, I've talked about proteins and how they're more than just food. They have a lot of different functions in our cells and bodies. Proteins are made of amino acids, and each amino acid has a distinct chemical property. And proteins fold to minimize the contact between the property of being hydrophobic, of propelling the water, they want to minimize its repulsion. When proteins don't fold correctly, they can aggregate, and prions, are aggregated protein that can cause the proteins in this cell. So I'll stop here for questions. Yes. So why uh, why are the prions uh, infectious? I don't understand that characteristic. Right. So why are prions infectious? Is the question. So um, as we uh, find earlier, infectious can be from you know the spread of cows to humans. So in humans, we have this prion protein in our brains. Um, and normally we don't have the disease, but when we do get, um, when we find these prion aggregates from the meat of a mad cow, then it will misfold the proteins in our brains to cause disease. 
So now the prion from the meat now is causing disease, and that way it's infectious. How long has the word prion been with us, and who made it up? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. So how long has the word prion been with us, and, and who made it up? Who got to name it? I, I'm actually not familiar with uh, that. Do you know? Um, so, <laughs> but, but um, so it was interesting was when I was doing some research um, into trying to find out more about cow disease. There are some articles printed um, in the late 1980s when they were trying to figure out what exactly was going on. And they're like, oh yeah, this one researcher at, in, in California, so keep in mind this is in the United Kingdom. So there's some researcher in California in the United States thinks that a, per, uh, that a protein causes disease. He calls it a prion. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of skepticism. Um, so it could be that he was the first person to coin the term, but I'm not quite sure if it existed before that. Katie looks like she's on Wikipedia. A quick Google search has revealed that it was coined in 1982 by Stanley B. Prusiner, and it's a portmanteau mm -hmm. of yeah. protein and infection. Great. Uh, I'll just repeat it for the live stream. Right? Yeah. Please do. That uh, a prion is from 19, the term was 1982, and sort of a combination of protein and infection, so pre and prion. Yeah. So uh, you talked about how PRP is found in what are there any theories of, at all as to what it could be used for? Because I could imagine some memories not being needed anymore. Is that, is that at all? That's a great question. So the question is, what is the function of PRP in the brain? Do you have any theories? Um, and um, it also sort of goes into this idea of uh, when the PRP from the, from the cow affects this, is the disease caused from a loss of the function of this? Of this protein. So, I don't think we totally understand this function. Some people think that it's involved in transporting copper ions uh, into a nerve, so it might be involved in that type of signaling. Um, but when, when you take mice and you remove the ground protein, you don't really um, see any clear phenotypes. Um, so, it is a, a current area of research. Anything to add? An interesting thing to note is that um, the normally folded prion protein actually exists on the surface of the cells, so it makes it easier for misfolded prions to come in and cause them to misfold. It's not like the misfolded, but that it's not like the prion aggregate, the therapy aggregate has to get into the cells because it, the, the protein that wants to misfold is already out on the outside of the cell. So that's what we know about it. We don't really know too much. That's a great question, and especially more for how to understand how disease is. So it's not really to the, the function of PRP as it's found normally in the brain, but do we know how it causes neuronal death or kills itself? That's also an area of okay. uh, research, and we'll touch a little bit on that in another article. But uh, you know, it's uh, expressed on, in all types of tissues, it's on mainly. So, it's a great question. So, where do you find ground proteins? Uh, is it expressed only in the brain or is it expressed uh, in all tissues? So it's not just in the brain, it's not expressed just in the brain, and it is an interesting curiosity why uh, neurons seem to be uh, specifically susceptible to disease. And you actually see that across different types of neurological disease as well. And another interjection. Um, so, uh, prion, so normal prion proteins also found a lot of immune cells. So a lot of research believes that when, when the prion protein kind of leaves your GI tract, it enters into the immune system first. But because immune cells kind of turn over, so you know, when they, they, they die, they kind of make more, but neurons in the brain, they don't do that. Once they die, they die. So that could be a reason why neurons are particularly uh, susceptible to prions, that when they have their immune cells, they'll die and they here. Do they know the sequence of the amino acids in a, um, both the normal and the abnormal version of the prion? So the question is, do we have the sequence of the protein, uh, both in the, in the normal and the abnormal state? So I'll also use this question to clarify that um, the sequence of the proteins actually is the same. Um, it may have been unclear the way I was trying to diagram it, but the correctly folded protein and the uh, incorrectly folded protein is the same sequence. From humans to cows, it's, it's slightly different. Um, but yes, we do know the sequence. 
It's just so the difference uh, between the normal protein and the disease protein is just how it happens. Great question. Okay, so I think with that, we'll take an intermission. Yep, we'll be back in 10 or 15 minutes or so, but we're going to grab some snacks, ask some questions. If you have any more after that wonderful question session, or fill out a survey. Or fill out a survey. <laughs>
first time to the watcher or you were not yet on our mailing list, you can put your email at the top. Um, we will put you on our mailing list. We just send out a weekly newsletter with updates on blog, upcoming lectures, and other exciting things. Um, this is also a good way to access our Facebook page, our Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, all the things that kids are doing these days. And um, often on those social media platforms, we'll do things like give away cool science art. So for your benefit, rather than mine. Um, and we will never send you anything but those things. Uh, so that's just a quick plug. I also want to remind you to stick around for the demo afterwards if you are so inclined. Um, but I think that's all I have to say. And I'll let you go ahead. Thank you. So um, before we go on to the last, to the third and last part, I do just want to clarify something that came up in the first uh, question next session. Really was, was your question about uh, vaccines for PRP and, and use of antibodies. So it turns out we actually can uh, have antibodies bind to proteins, but the difficulty is, uh, and we'll go back to uh, your question at the top, um, is that the sequence is the same between the folded and the misfolded protein. So it actually is sort of, it's technically challenging to develop uh, an antibody for the unfolded protein without hitting the correctly folded protein. But I will actually discuss that uh, as a strategy later on. So, just to clarify that. All right, so on to the third and final part of our talk, we're going to cover other neurological diseases um, and different approaches for, treat for treating them. So going back to our idea of uh, protein aggregation, um, so as we mentioned in that cow disease, uh, proteins aggregate and so they cause disease. So here we have our cartoon neurons again. Uh, these neurons will make a misfolded protein and represent this misfolded protein as a blue rectangle. Uh, these misfolded proteins will accumulate and aggregate together, and that aggregation will somehow cause neuronal death. Now it's important to note that we, as a field, we don't really know how protein aggregation, aggregation, uh, protein aggregation causes neuron disease. It's a very, very, very active field of research in a number of different types of diseases, including mad cow disease. Um, so yeah, that's why I boxed it and put like four question marks because we really do not know what's going on. All right, so there are different. Um, so if you think about this model of protein aggregation. Um, the way that a lot of people are trying to think about therapeutics or different drugs to target this is by trying to figure out one, a way to decrease uh, the neuron making protein, and another approach is to decrease, uh, decrease the chances of the misfolded proteins from aggregating together. Um, so, from this point on in the talk, Noah and I will introduce uh, two other neurological diseases and how different therapeutics uh, that work on this pathway that I've uh, that diagrammed here are being used to treat these diseases. So we're starting with Alzheimer's disease. I'm sure a number of you have heard this disease before. It affects over 5 million people in the US. And the age of onset is usually about um, greater than 65 years of age. So it's a pretty late onset disease. So there's a lot of neurodegeneration in the brain. And one of the key symptoms is loss of memory. So what basically hap what happens is that um, neurons that are important for memory formation and memory uh, retaining um, memory formation and for retaining memory um, by the time. So here uh, I have, I'm going to make this mistake again, on your left, yes, uh, a cartoon of a normal brain. So this is if you just take a brain and just cut it in half. That's what a normal brain looks like. When a patient has Alzheimer's disease, what we see is that the brain is much smaller than the normal brain. This comes as a result because a lot of neurons have died and the, and the brain has lost a lot of mass. So we'll see, this, these spaces here that weren't that big in the normal brain wind up much larger in the regular brain. Same with these poles here that were much smaller here. So overall, there's a lot of neurons that die in Alzheimer's disease. Now, the, so one of the key accumulating proteins in Alzheimer's disease is known as amyloid beta. So here I have a picture of, of another type of staining for neurons. So all these blue specks over here, those are all neurons. And then these giant brown blobs, those are plaques of amyloid beta, so large accumulations of amyloid beta. And as you can see, they are much larger than the neurons. So they really do represent a substantial amount of nerve. So once these enemies start forming, as you, as you can imagine, they probably start to push neurons aside or somehow cause these neurons to die to really take up that much space. Uh, again, we don't really know how amyloid beta, the activation of amyloid beta causes the disease. 
So let's go back to this chart that our God put together previously. So he talked about the three different characteristics of prion proteins, or prion proteins. We have that they're infectious, they must hold nitrate, and that they're temporal. So amyloid and Alzheimer's disease, we don't really know if it's infectious. So this idea that it can spread from one human to the other. I don't know if it's something people have been testing. I generally think no. <laughs> um, and it, it does misfold and it does aggregate. And people do debate within the field whether or not a misfold and amyloid beta can cause other amyloid beta to misfold. So we just put a maybe here. So because amyloid beta doesn't have all three of these characteristics of a prion protein, we're going to call it prion like. So it's like a prion protein, it has one of these characteristics, it misfolds and aggregates, but it is not a prion. So here we have um, our neuron. So I was talking previously about how one way we can prevent protein aggregation is to prevent um, the neurons from making these misfolded proteins. So here, um, if we zoom in on our neuron, we'll find something called beta secretase. So beta secretase is an enzyme. Beta secretase makes amyloid beta. So one therapeutic approach that scientists have taken is they generate these small things called inhibitors, these small molecules. These inhibitors would, would bind to beta secretase and prevent beta secretase from making more amyloid beta. So this is something that currently is in active clinical trials. Um, there's actually a clinical trial that just started this past December 2016. Um, it's currently now in phase three. So basically what that means is they have a lot of patients that have Alzheimer's disease. They're giving, they're giving them uh, beta secretase inhibitors and seeing if it has any effect. Okay, so we go back to our diagram about misfold proteins and aggregation neuron death. If we prevent the neuron from making misfold protein, we won't have misfold protein. Therefore, there will be no protein to make aggregation, and with no aggregates that magically cause neuron death, the neurons will be happy and alive. So that's a general idea of how, of how we can use inhibitors uh, to prevent protein generation and to decrease protein aggregation. And so I'll discuss another strategy to inhibit um, aggregation leading to, to neuron death. Um, but the example of Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's disease, um, 60,000 people are diagnosed with Parkinson's disease in the United States every year. Famously, Michael J. Fox has been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And he actually has an amazing foundation for Parkinson's disease research. There's a lot of resources there. Uh, he also talks about clinical trials. Um, Parkinson's disease is a disease of aging. Only 4% of people that have Parkinson's disease were diagnosed before the age of 50. And the main symptoms of Parkinson's disease is a tremor, slow movement, trouble balancing, and stiffness of the arms and And the key protein involved in Parkinson's disease, or that we see in Parkinson's disease, is called alpha synuclein. And this is a blown up image of a neuron, so this uh, blue part is the the neuron, main part of the neuron, and this big blob here, that's the aggregate of alpha synuclein. So I hope you see from this slide and the slide that Vicky showed of uh, amyloid beta aggregates that my slide of the aggregates getting out of control wasn't an exaggeration. They really run this message. And so again, uh, animal, uh, alpha synuclein doesn't have all of the characteristics of prions. Uh, we don't know if it's infectious. Um, it does miss fold and aggregate. And, uh, whether the templates or not, I think for absolutely there's more of a, um, more of the field does think that it, it, it in fact templates. So if you um, have this folded absolutely, it will cause uh, normally folded absolutely in the cells and also in the cell. So if we look at misfolded uh, proteins, if we think about a strategy where you don't prevent the production of misfolded proteins, we can look at a strategy where we try to hit how the uh, misfolded proteins start to come together to form the act. So again, you have this uh, blue fold of uh, rectangle uh, protein as a rectangle coming together. But what if we use antibodies? Um, this is why I wanted to make a clarification earlier. Again, antibodies are used by our immune system to detect uh, foreign pathogens uh, like uh, bacteria and viruses. And again, you have these uh, little arms here to grab on. So we can actually uh, try to engineer uh, the antibody to recognize the misfolded form of alpha and that way, you, you take up the part, you bind to the part of the protein where another misfolded uh, protein might come in, and you actually block that interaction from happening. 
And so in our, in our larger diagram here, even if the cell is making this voltage protein, if we use engineered antibodies to block the missile protein coming together, we can block aggregation and hopefully block uh, cell death. So I just want to show you some actual data from an experiment using these uh, engineered proteins. So on the left, we have slides of grains. Um, on the top, we have without any drug. Again, the, the blue dots are neurons. These brown speckles are aggregates. Uh, the stain uses uh, SYN506 with uh, critical detail. Uh, and then when you add a therapeutic antibody to mice that have this disease, you see uh, a less amount of the brown speckles. And so on the right, we just have a graph actually counting that across all of the pictures because one picture may be deceiving. Um, and so when we, when we chart the number of aggregates as a percentage of before treatment, so without any treatment, you have 100%. When you add the therapeutic antibody, you now get a 30% reduction, which may, um, at least on this graph, seem small, but we think that could actually make a difference in the course of disease. And it's currently in phase one trial in humans, which means that they're currently evaluating its safety. All right, so the two drugs that we mentioned are currently in clinical trials. Uh, so the one on top, Verbistat, that was the beta secretase inhibitor that I mentioned previously that's currently in phase three clinical trials. And then BIB054, I know, a very appealing and attractive name, um, is the alpha-synuclein anti alpha antibody that no one mentioned previously. An important thing to note that even though these are two drugs that are currently in clinical trials, they are two drugs of an extremely long list of drugs that are currently Trials. All of these drugs in some way have to do with modulating uh, protein production or protein aggregation. Mm. So as you can see, there's a lot of different directions that people, that scientists are taking to approach these diseases and to try to, uh, try to treat them. So as a larger summary for the third part of our talk, uh, so there are neurological diseases that have prion-like proteins uh, that can aggregate. Again, these proteins are prion-like because they have some prion characteristics, but not all of them. And from what we have learned from prion diseases, uh, by preventing a decreasing protein aggregation, we can somehow try to prevent disease. And there are many therapeutics currently in clinical trials. There's a large conclusion for our whole talk. Um, so PRP, PRP is prion that causes metabolic disease. Prions are infectious proteins that can disfold and aggregate, template, and cause disease. There are other neurological diseases that we mentioned, like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, that have proteins that are prion-like. And understanding how prions work and how these be, and how these properties are unique to these types of proteins can help scientists understand and develop drug approaches for these diseases. Um, so here is our thank you slide for science in the news and always in the organizations. Um, so yeah, one on any last questions we can have. Questions? Yes. Well, so no Parkinson is into cell And is it in a cell or a new case? And secondly, how do you get antibody into the cell? That's a great question. Oh, so um, <coughs> the question is, so I'll in. Um, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> uh, the question is, uh, so alpha nucleotide is, is a protein that you find inside of cells, um, contrasted to the that we talked about the uh, outside of cells. Um, so the question is, how do you get an antibody to actually detect um, the alpha nucleus that's inside cells? Do you know the or do you need to So, and are the aggregates in the cytoplasm of the cells or in the nucleus of the cell? So, to answer that question, they're in the cytoplasm of the cell. Um, alpha nucleus, we think normally, uh, before it's been sold, it acts to um, in uh, vesicular trafficking or processing of neurons to actually communicate signals between neurons. Um, the question of how it spreads from neuron to neuron uh, in, in the course of disease and how an antibody can actually get it, get it, it um, during that, I think it's still interesting and in, in that very good research. Um, just for everyone else, uh, antibodies can't uh, go inside of cells, so there's sort of this uh, Challenge of how do you actually target something inside of cells? Um, and so, one idea might be that once the cell dies, then you can't um, shield the aggregate. So, maybe that's how it's preventing. Um, we're not sure. I'm not sure if it's a sort of an active mode to, um, from one neuron to send the aggregate to another. 
on their own, but that might also be a target for the pandemic. That's a great question. So we have, uh, you know, Alpha Nucleon, which is involved in sort of Parkinson's disease, which has a lot of sort of movement manifestations as far as clinical manifestations go. And then you have um, the beta amyloid, which is a, sort of causing part, uh, Alzheimer's disease, which has more uh, like memory, um, memory impairment, cognitive dysfunction. Uh, what do you think accounts? They're, they're both, you know, plaque, or they're both, they're both related to sort of aggregation of physical proteins. What accounts for the difference in like clinical manifestations of disease? Uh, so the question is, so as we know, Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease have different clinical manifestations, they have different symptoms, um, but they both involve aggregation of proteins. So why is it that um, amyloid beta is specific to neurons that are involved in memory, and why is it that alpha nucleus is specific to neurons that are involved in motor function? Um, so that's a really good question. Actually, what's interesting is that when uh, patients with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, you'll find that over time, as the disease gets worse, they start losing memory, losing um, motor functions. Now, it is very, it, it, it's active to feel the reason, people are trying to figure out why is it that with, Alice, with uh, Parkinson's, it specifically targets one area of the brain? Why is it in, or, or, or rather, it's the question of why is it that these diseases start off in a specific part of the brain and then spread to other places? Um, that's something that we don't entirely know why at this moment. Well, one thought for Parkinson's disease is that usually it lose uh, neurons that are involved in dopamine signaling. So there, uh, there's a current section of the field that thinks that maybe the normal function uh, of alpha smoothly is to be involved in dopamine signaling. So maybe once that gets screwed up, then those specific neurons that are involved in dopamine signaling and the consequences, that's how you get that type of manifestation. Good question. Great, thank you very much. Great, if you'd like to stay for the demo, please do so. Um, and if not, please grab a survey on your way out and let us know what you thought and what we can do better next time. Thanks. Oh, um, yeah, double.
Yeah. I don't remember. Yeah. 